Welcome to That's Lit, the Lightbox podcast. We're a venture capital firm based in Mumbai, investing in consumer businesses in India. On this podcast, we're going to be talking about all things consumption, culture, and technology. Our idea is simple. We love to learn. Come learn with us. Together, we'll dig into new ideas, new ways of thinking, and new approaches to solving problems from industry experts across various fields. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome back to another episode of our podcast. Today we have Nisa Godridge, who's the chairperson of Godridge Consumer Products Limited, part of the Godridge Group. Uh, it's a business with diversified products across health and beauty, uh, insecticides, and a variety of other areas. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about consumer brand sustainability, um, geographical expansion, product development, direct-to-consumer brands, and just generally how the, the market has evolved over the course of the last year, especially with uh, COVID and what's happened. Um, Nisa, uh, Nisa and I have known each other for a while, and so I'm excited to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sandeep. Really happy to be here with you. Just don't ask very <laughs> hard questions. Lightbox podcast where we talk about the things that make you go. Hmm. So, listen. I, I guess just to start with, um, I'll start with the topic you and I have talked a bit about over the years. This is tech and the impact of tech and the changing of tech in the entire ecosystem. And it's, it's one that um, clearly direct to consumer brands are growing. People are believing that they can reach the customer through other channels. Distribution has been a big advantage for larger companies over the years. Are you, how, how do you think about that world? Is there something that um, you see changing for you in it? And, um, and, and yeah, how do you see it evolving? Yeah, so Sandeep, I think, uh, you know, when we think about tech and we think about D2C and we think about distribution, um, you know, in consumer products, if I give you a bit of a, you know, of the landscape, 80% is still our Kirana stores, you know, 10% is what we call sort of modern trade, which is your DMARTs and your Reliance. And then, you know, depending on the category, uh, for us, it's about 5% right now is on e-commerce. But what we're seeing, uh, uh, Sandeep, is that especially because of, co- you know, especially sort of, um, you know, with COVID, uh, this digitization is happening actually across all channels. So even your Kirana store, there's a lot of disruption coming, whether it's, you know, from what was the traditional distributor's or wholesalers being, you know, kind of pushed out a little bit by players like uh, Oran or some of the work Geo's um, Geo's doing. So, you know, the way I think about it is, you know, when people get panicked, like, oh God, what's going to happen? Amazon's going to, you know, we make products like soaps and household insecticides, what's going to happen? Because all these people are going to bring their private labels because that's where they'll make the margins and stuff. So I think... Um, change is, you know, change is not coming. It's here and it's it's happening uh, extremely rapidly. Uh, we have to, even as a you know c- company that is that was not founded in the last ten years, it's important to embrace this change. And I'll talk a little bit about it, you know, that as we go along. Also, in terms of what are the advantages D two C or this digitization of the Kirana store um, uh, can bring you. And at the same time, uh, you really must focus on your core, which is your brands, correct? And you have to keep strengthening your brands and keep making sure that they are very meaningful to the consumer because then whichever channel you're going through, that's where it gives you um, 
you know, gives you your strength. And we've seen this, you know, I think these conversations that all these big brands will get uh, uh, disrupted, at least in consumer products, brands are able to survive, you know, where, you know, decades or uh, even up to you know, some of these brands are over 100 years old because they keep renewing themselves and serving the consumer. So I think that's very important to focus on while embracing the chain. And actually, you brought up brand, and, and I think that's a, another area I wanted to talk about, which is hey, you, you've you managed to take, let's say, the parent brand and extend it across categories, whereas some of the other larger yeah. uh, or, or large um, FMCG businesses have opted to keep the parent brand or the parent company's brand silent in the background and not stretch it. And, and actually, we, we've thought about this and looked at as distribution becomes more tech-enabled and, and perhaps more single channel as opposed to the thousands of Kiranas that we're, we're dealing with in the, in, in the offline world. Is there an advantage that you see to having the, the parent brand being so strong? And, and is that the direction that's going to even benefit you even more so as you think about this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the parent brand, which is Godrej, we never, I, I mean, you know, this is an evolution that's happened. You know, we're going to be 125 years um, old or young as we'd like to see it next year. But, um, you know, I don't think this was a thought through strategy at any point, or if it was, it was before my time. So I think what the parent brand does, it does give you a foot in the door in terms of trust and quality. Um, But, you know, sometimes a parent brand can also have a negative, correct? So I think you have to really think about your company, think about the categories, Um, that you're going into and see, you know, do the positives outweigh the negatives. So I I, I don't think there's a, you know, a master brand is right or a master brand is wrong. And you see companies going both ways, correct? Um, You know, a lot of the FMCG companies like Unilever, SC Johnson, we actually see them putting the parent brand, you know, bringing it into advertising and things like that. So, you know, in the same way, we also see brands moving away. So is, is, is this, brand. like you said, wasn't a, a thought-out strategy earlier. Is this now a firm strategy, uh, as, as you think, going forward? I think as a, I think, I, I think in India, as an endorser brand, it works very, very well. So if we do research, you know, whether it's on old or new brands, um, uh, you know, it does, we do, you know, even when we've done sort of, digitally first brands putting the Godrej on the packaging gets your click-throughs up so I think for India it makes sense but now you know as a global company we haven't really focused as much as getting the Godrej brand out there as a master brand in other countries there the Godrej comes at the back of the pack let's talk a little bit about that then the uh the global expansion I mean, this has been a big focus for you uh, yeah. when, when you took over and, and you said that this is a big part of where you see growth coming from. H- how is that? Yeah. Uh, h- how did that start? What were the challenges? What has been the, the, the current situation with it? Yeah, I think the, 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 you know, the opportunity as we saw it was um, that in, you know, other emerging markets would behave similarly to India where, you know, high quality value for money products driven by sort of deep distribution and sort of very strong cost economics, um, you know, and categories with low penetration. So there's a lot of headroom for our growth. So we did uh, acquisitions in um, Indonesia and all across the African, uh, African continent. And I think a lot of what we said, uh, um, you know, has played out, uh, has played out as we thought. In Africa, we went into a category called um, hair fashion, which is, uh, you know, African women put extensions on their hair. Um, so it's it's not really a category that, you know, women of other races actually use. And there, I think uh, we, um, you know, we didn't estimate our lack of knowledge of the category correctly, correct? And, you know, we've we've all been to business school and you read about this, you know, how, you know, what is the distance of geography and category from your core? 
and you know and then when you actually do it in practice you don't pay as much attention and i think we've definitely suffered some consequences uh some consequences from that but uh, you know you learn as you go along the way and uh, we're really quite excited about the potential of the african continent and of some of these categories i guess that's really where um entrepreneurs start from right which is they, they know nothing about anything to some extent and they have the the willingness to just get in there and and work to figure it out and it sounds like to some extent you found yourself in that position with hair hair extensions and i guess you've worked to figure it out and that that sounds very much keeping the business in a very entrepreneurial mind frame to to be willing to take risks like that and get into areas where there's a lot to work out but you believe you can For sure I think in any business you know Sandeep my dad always says that you know that we sometimes discount that people who are very successful or you know become that and up from that success um we we sort of see them when they're at the top of the game correct and um, but why there's so few people like that is also just the tenacity it takes to keep going at it correct and i think any of us whether it's an entrepreneur when you you know whether you're a professional working in an established business um <laughs> you know you're going to have lots of failures you're going to fall down flat on your face i think it's the amount of time um you know did the amount of times that you succeeded and picked yourself up did they just outweigh the failures right and if they did um you're doing well Although I had I had one Wharton professor Sandeep who told me that everyone will tell you it's great to learn from failure but it's much better to learn <laughs> from success. So I mean you know obviously we tell ourselves this I mean say the Africa and you know I'm very glad we did Africa I think you know that is you know it will be a very important part of our future I think for me personally um you know i didn't start this company so you know i'm just this trustee ship of the company for a number of years and i hope to leave a legacy uh, in africa but you know it was an acquisition so if nothing else i would have paid much less for it but <laughs> hindsight is so l- l- let's go back to the uh direct to consumer and um these new new age companies that are coming about you know they've they've made the cost of entering categories really low let's say by just being able to grab products from places and put a brand on it and they believe that many people believe that it's their communication and their customer acquisition strategy and their positioning of the brand that will carry them forward to a level of scale perhaps when they can ultimately get into their own real product development and product differentiation whereas i think you've come from a very different place where you guys have had strength in product development had have had years of research development and ability to understand customer needs from a a, a very um real perspective of having users who use products how do you um how do you think that translates over time as an advantage does that something that these guys are going to have to build sooner rather than later if they're really going to compete in a in a world or is it something that um you can kind of say all right they they'll they'll figure it out they should be able to get there and or, or do you rely heavily on your product exper- expertise to to ensure differentiation you know i think what some of the sort of uh you know d2c or digitally first companies have done is quite amazing correct even in the sort of beauty and personal care space scaled up quite um strongly especially just doing it on e-commerce without you know having sort of offline trade um so you know hats off to them but i would think that sustainability also comes from repeat customers correct so customers who are repeating and not just because you keep launching um new skus you 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 need to have your consumers come and repeat your product and that really happens from good quality products correct um and if you don't focus on that um at some point it's going to hit you and uh sandeep i don't know you know in a very different you know there's all this excitement in fmcg about these d2c brands correct and we frankly i've studied some of the product quality 
of these brands mm. and it's not so good so uh, you know you could you could see some of the fallout of that coming and I, you know a few years ago sandeep patanjali was going to mm-hmm. take all of us over and yeah. throw us out of india if you sort of yeah. remember correct and uh, people were obviously you know this whole natural trend and this is the future and you know and look where they are today correct? and they didn't have product quality they didn't run their factories uh, in the best possible yeah. way correct so at that so that he and you know the kind of you know he was on tv all the time and the kind of branding and i mean just fantastic but at the end of the day the consumer is going to repeat buy because they find the product good because they love the product and um you know and and so maybe i'll give you a really you know something in godrej so we started our consumer products um our fmcg business making soap and i think ever since we started and we were the first in uh, first first in the world to actually commercially make soap from vegetable oils so it used to be out of animal fats and you can understand what sort of religious sentiments why this vegetable oil soap mm-hmm. did really well and uh, soap i mean soap is mostly oil and um, you know and now we're having a big sort of commodity price inflation we are one of the companies who we don't touch our quality correct we don't reduce the oil in soap we always keep our soaps the total fatty matter at grade 1 correct and this would say in a year like this um, if i tweaked my quality i could put 50 crores mm-hmm. to the bottom line consumers wouldn't probably realize that it had been done correct but if you keep doing yeah. do, do you know what i mean but you as a company have to say no but this is a long term play and quality really matters um so i i i think these young companies have to be very careful that you know you build business also and repeat yeah Not just on I mean, it's interesting In our our world of tech investing you often see hype driving cycles right and you get very taken yeah. by I don't know whether it is um there was laundry companies for a while that were really hot and everyone was investing in those there it, it ranges right and it ranges from short form video content to now it could be D2C companies but if the core product at these doesn't sustain then repeatability doesn't exist and that you're going to be different and yeah and and so there has to be core product quality and then you have to see like like there's a lot that these D- d2c can do there's a lot that digital can do correct like i'm a woman in my 40s i have my hair falling i have acne i have all sorts of like beauty issues correct which someone like me has access to a dermatologist i go i figure out um new things because of the dermatologist correct but um this I'll give you a really silly example she said start you know having this collagen powder in your coffee and she told me this a year ago i ignored her and then she said no i really think you should do it it'll help your skin and it was amazing right and then i googled it and it's all online now this is something that's not going to be your traditional tv ad it's a very premium product right but i think your digital ecosystem there is a set of you know consumers in india I, you know i don't know what the depth is at a very premium pricing but who you can sort of educate and have a conversation for and it's beyond what our traditional marketing models of tv industry you know what you're doing with a brand like noa these are you know menstruation and women's health is not something everyone has a lot of knowledge about correct so i think there's a um there's a lot of there are a lot of categories where you can build both the education and the penetration correct for it um and and you know i would really focus um investing investing well, in those so companies let me ask you this again about uh, brand we've often talked about the idea here that um brands are built at the intersection of affordability and aspiration and this aspiration yeah. question versus affordability and i guess the waiting and one of the examples we've often given as we've talked about this idea was that the the tata nano for example was very affordable 
but due to the fact that it was the world's cheapest car and labeled as that, it was not very aspirational in, in terms of the position. And yeah. I guess as you, if you positioned it perhaps as a affordable, and, and you could have probably done something interestingly aspirational with it as well while maintaining the price point, it could yeah. have been a different story. When you look at it, yeah, yeah. go ahead. So I think, I'll give you, you know, we were, um, and you know, in Godrej's story, Sandeep, if I look about, you know, 12 to 15 years ago, where I actually got involved in the business and I got directly involved in brands and product development, correct? And actually in our hair color category, where they were saying, you're the grandparents brand, correct? And I was being told like, you know, we're not good enough. This was the internal story. We're not good enough to compete with L'Oreal. Their products are better. They're, and, you know, they're obviously like the world's strongest sort of uh, beauty uh, beauty brand. But I think, you know, we took inspiration. And I don't know if you remember Target back in the day used to have this whole, um, it was like almost like cheap and chic. Right, Target. Right? So it was... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Tarje, and that you know the, all the stories, like about the BMWs parked outside Target. So you can be affordable, but you can do it uh, with flair, quite. You can do it with a sense of uh, style. At the same time, you have to be sort of really authentic, uh, authentic to yourself. So even in this hair color, like if you look at the the you know we launched for the first time ever in India actually creme hair color and you know in sachets versus box packs it brought the price down but it also made it super easy uh, to use um, you know I sent this product to a lot of friends during lockdown and they were like we don't know why we've been wasting money in salons all these years and why didn't you give it to us before um, and actually, even the way we did the packaging and things like that, we went back to our roots, correct? So we really owned ourselves up. It's a, it's a great case study if any, you know, at any time with some of your companies, we can go through it. Um, so I think that's the, I, I think you have to, um, you know, really love your brand and bring it front and center. And price is just one part of it, correct? Don't down, don't down. Well, I, I guess yourself. that's uh, a, a big part of I yeah. think what's also coming into being is the the reality of um, the strength of who you are and the strength of India perhaps in, in general as a as a place for products because I, I'd imagine that especially with some of the things that have happened some of the lack of accessibility to other products from from around the world that provenance is, is becoming more relevant to people, the desire to know how it's made, a desire to know that it's coming from someplace they trust. So all this should be stuff that gets factored into what the brand actually can communicates. Whereas I think people tend to want to want to ape the West a lot. And maybe that's another thing to ask you is when, when you guys build things and look at stuff, how much of it is saying, okay, I, People want what's Western and therefore I'm going to communicate in a certain way. I, mean, I remember looking at brands here like Peter England and these are brands that were made in India, but with Western names. Um, yeah, but I think there's a, been, if you look in consumer products, there's been a huge Ayurvedic and, you know, the push mainly, mainly maybe because of Patanjali um, the other way. See, I think Sandeep, India is a very big market, correct? And actually the consumers, you know, your company speak to and the consumers I speak to, uh, you know, probably overlap, but very slightly, correct? Because we're really a mass market company. So I think one of the things is not to make the mistake of, there's obviously some stuff that, you know, and we know they're very global brands and the same thing sells all over the world. That's very possible, but not to make too many generalizations because you really need to think of India almost like a Europe because each state in tastes and stuff will be very different. So if you're in food, correct, um, like if you're doing tea in India, you do have to be sort of cognizant that the blends could actually be quite different. Even though you have one brand, the blends will be different across states, especially if you're a big company. Obviously, if you're doing hair color, that doesn't, um, you know, exactly work uh, work in the same way. 
and then there are lots of trends some be going or going at the same time right i remember doing naturals research and you know we had this huge thing there's everything everyone wants naturals naturals and frankly it's very difficult to actually get any of these products to be really actually mm-hmm. natural so a lot of it is just marketing and i remember going to you know consumers homes in delhi and uh, there was this one consumer who was you know talking about just how she uses natural stuff and has her wheat grass juice and the family is very religious and satsang and you know natural baby care products and when you ask her what's the most important baby product that you must have mm-hmm. and she's like it's a diaper mm-hmm. cut to another story where i'm doing research um and research in india sameep's amazing this women will like start talking about their family and their tears and it's it's quite something right how willingly they open up their houses and share and her 12 year old daughter comes out of the room uh and you know this is a two room house with dhai in her hair and i'm like oh this is like the perfect natural you know 12 year old girl wearing dhai and i'm like can you will you speak to me and she's like no no, no i have to wash my hair goes comes back you know why she had put dhai in her hair because she had tried to iron her hair with an iron to straighten it correct and i am talking this is a 20000 rupee a month oh, wow. income household and then she's telling me that i want some keratin straightening thing when i'm older and i can get it which is which costs about i don't know must have at that time cost about 20000 rupees to get done so you so do i think there are all these trends going on together correct so you need to really identify sort of who is the core customer you're going out going after how big uh you know is that set what is the penetration of your product for them and really really what matters to them correct and message them on those one or two things there's a book i forget i think young me moon is the I'm not sure if the author. Different, it's called okay. Different. She was a Harvard Business School professor. I remember reading this now, 15 years ago. It was fantastic, correct? And she talks about this idea of, you know, market research makes all companies regress to the mean. And how do you actually stand out and be different? And I would really, you know, encourage entrepreneurs. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, we'll check that out. Um I was going to talk a little bit about COVID and how you know I guess yeah. I obviously shocked everyone's system when it came about and you know business is shut you guys had to deal with that as well um revenues down clearly things have bounced back but let, let's just go back maybe a year and a half and think about or maybe it's a little less than that how did you handle it what was the what went on both internally as a company and and even in terms of how you thought about customers and what you were thinking that you had to to do or communicate with them. Oh, yeah. So I think um I think you know when covid and I have to tell you something funny, you know a month or two into covid some you know I I'd started actually this app called Emerge Stronger where I kept pinging everyone in the company with questions mm-hmm. to get answers and a bunch of people said we should have been, you know, fully prepared for this and you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm going to find all of them and put them in a group because they are going to be ones who prepare us next time <laughs> for when the shit goes down but anyway so yeah you know it 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 was it was a shock and you know to be uh, to be honest it's you know not something that you've ever prepared for i think the first thing for a company like us so the group actually um was you know and and you know we're very lucky we're not we're not highly leveraged we're quite a conservative sort of group also the industries we played in nothing was you know really very badly impacted but we took decisions quite early on on things like securing pay securing people that you know we would we would secure them as far as uh, far as possible so i think we really sort of leaned into it with our values you know keep people safe and stuff um and i think then the hustle started sandeep because you know we make soap 
people need you know everyone's being told to hand you know wash your hands we make insecticide so please don't get malaria and dengue right now so i think we really sort of focused on that and what we sort of did um you know this concept of hopeful realism so we did share any sort of bad news and gcpl had actually you know the previous couple of years had or that year itself because of that big march drop in sales hadn't done well but you know we we were very honest that you know covid it doesn't look good we don't know how it'll play out there's huge supply chain uh, disruptions but you know here's the that's the realism but here's the hope you know we are behind you no pay cut we're going to stand behind people and then we need you to hustle correct and people are going to need soap they are going to need uh you know our products 80% of our portfolio uh should be you know there will be a cake of where you know discretionary might go down but uh i calculated that 80% of our portfolio would uh do fine because either it's essential or it's very value for money and things like hair color or these hair extensions and uh I was really surprised that I was quite bang on <laughs> not you know, about that. And I'm not <laughs> normally bang on about something, but I had to like throw that in. And and then we said, you know, um like leadership has to be distributed at this time. So we didn't sit in Bombay and say, you know, we can manage um you know Accra or Lagos from here and knowing what's going on. So you know, we're a very trust-based organization also, so we just said, you know, literally sales like you decide um whether it's safe to go to the market or not and in a way you know you like a lot of the american companies in the first wave say in india told their people not to step out correct mm-hmm. at all uh didn't open their factories as fast as we did and and you know i i know one competitor sort of complained to one of our ceos saying you know i'm spending all my time Uh, you know desi- redesigning the office for space but my factories are not open so I'm losing you know and these are essential products that your consumers actually need um yeah so i think it's you know a hopeful realism you know give the bad news give the good news distribute uh leadership hustle learn as you go and constant feedback we had a lot of conversations and feedback all the time and you can use technology yeah. and, and let me ask this. did you find that uh, there's been any shift in consumers in terms of what they care about as a result of all of this is there more of a focus on whether it's the environment sustainability the impact you're having or is that too much to think that that's going to penetrate you i think the sustainability question Oh uh, Sandeep I I don't think my mass consumer correct who's buying you know my 1 rupee uh, fast card paper household insecticide it's top of mind for them frankly um obviously there is a set of consumers that really care about it and we'll see that happen more but if i can just step back for a second and say look we're in emerging markets which means that our per capita income is still much lower than it, you know much lower than china and obviously much lower than the west and as per capita income grows consumption will increase correct of these categories and it is upon us to think about how we grow these categories correct because there's no point in saying we spend hundreds of millions of dollars putting sugared water into mm. plastic bottles and then you know 20 years down the line talking about how to take a little bit of sugar out and how to take a little bit of plastic mm. out of that correct so we really need to think first principles um uh, on some of this stuff whether it's on nutrition whether it's on cl- climate change pollution correct i mean I mean someone needs to get like this covid people you know what covid had but what about air pollution in india yeah. correct so i think you know i think for organizations like ours mm-hmm. we really need to innovate to find you i don't think you should deny the consumer the need correct like i don't think you should deny a 13 year old girl 
uh, the just the you know what a sanitary napkin can do, correct? It's not on her that this creates waste. It's on us. It's on the government to solve these issues. But uh, but you guys have set some targets for yourself in terms of what you're going to do on the sustainability side. Bearing in mind that, like you said, the the common consumer may or may not care, and you're doing this perhaps as a responsibility to the world around you. But you've said that you're going to be water positive uh, in 2025. Yeah, you're yeah. carbon neutral. I think this year. Yeah, and in 2011, we set some of these goals. We reached most of them, correct? Um, and and can, but can I just just step back from that? I think there's a there's a there's a design to product also that matters, correct? So, you know, as consumers move say from something like bar soap to hand wash, like we've launched this product called Magic Hand Wash, which is 15 rupees. It's a powder to liquid, so I only transport the powder, not the you know 90% of water in it, and you make it by reconstituting it. So Mr. these Magic, are solutions, right? yeah, Mr. Magic. And this has a lower sort of footprint than a bar soap, correct? But it's giving people more hygienic. So this, 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 Sandeep, we should be able to do across categories, correct? And actually, it's up to companies. You know, we all like to talk about our best selves and not our true self. Mm-hmm. But my thing is we should really you know, really be almost saying that, you know, this is a green category, this is an amber category, and this is a red category, correct? Mm -hmm. Some of it based on sustainability, some of it based on consumer health, some of it, you know, being a bit more holistic in our thinking. So what was the thought behind Mr. Magic born out of how do we make a more sustainable product? Or was it what, what, what drove the it was more it was more born out of how do you do disruptive pricing. Yeah. But if you think of disruptive pricing, it means taking everything out that you don't need. Correct? Which is the you don't need to transport water around, which makes it more sustainable. See, there is gonna be a look, there is a there, there's no question there is a green premium, correct? For in how you make or if you're using a lot of renewable energy and stuff. So it is, if you have to be very competitive and only one company is doing a certain thing, it can be, you know, it, it, and, you know, you also have investors and shareholders. So I think some of this is going to have to be sort of, and I wouldn't like government actually to regulate it. Um, maybe in some cases they, they, they need to, but, you know, industry bodies themselves self-regulate some of these things and say, you know, we are going to move our industry in this way. Yeah, I think, um, again, the the whole notion, at least why I got involved in investing in tech businesses was the thought was you should be able to use technology to remove costs and thereby create better propositions for consumers. And somewhere along the way, at least in my world, some of that has seemed to have gotten lost. And uh, it's been more, we'll put a tech layer on and we'll just simply market a lot and spend a lot of money and eventually figure it out. But I think that, you know, it's, it, you, it's great that you're being straight about the fact that with Mr. Magic, it was driven out of how do you change the, the pricing proposition here. And as a result, you've created something that logically makes a ton of sense. Why would you want Yeah, and we don't, and there's no marketing of it and leap on sustainability hmm. at all. Huh? If you look at the advertising and all of that, nothing. Because it's a consumer who's, more like, why should I buy this product? And they're not buying it because it's so, sustainable. Coming to values again, I mean, a lot of what you guys have done has been driven by clarity of values and clarity of who you are. And that's translated whether in terms of how you handled the crisis with COVID, how you thought about product evolution. One of the values that I've come to appreciate from the conversations I've had with you and with others within Godridge is diversity and inclusion. And um, I think this yeah. has been a big one that, I think started years ago for you and, um, and you've really pushed it. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about why it's important and what you think you're, you're getting out of it? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think Sandeep, if you, if you look at Godrej, it actually started in India's freedom movement and, you know, it was really very much part of Mahatma Gandhi's Swadeshi movement. One of the most, uh, you know, one of our prized possession is a letter he wrote, uh, you know, about, uh, about Godrej and 
So I think that, you know, that idea that you can stand for, you know, people, planet, it's, it's, it's beyond profits, I think has always been sort of um, within the thread of uh, the organization. And I think we just, you know, in our DNA, um, really believe sort of inequality and, you know, that actually drives business, it drives innovation. Um, you know, you're, it, is, it is incredibly important. That being said, it's not that, you know, we've had some perfect journey on this or, um, you know, actually some of our diversity numbers look better because of some of the international geographies that we operate in, where we have, say, at least gender diversity um, is much higher in India, it's, 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 it's a struggle, actually, because, you know, as you know, the participation rate of women um, in the formal economy has actually fallen over the last decades. I think we're hovering somewhere right above Saudi Arabia. Um, so, but I think it's, I think it's critically, critically, um, critically, critically important because it's really, I think, what creates in innovation, it stops you from making mistakes and it's not just diversity it's just it's not just the numbers and the that matters it really matters that people are included and they have a voice correct so it's actually even worse just to have someone there because it looks good correct their voice um their voice must be heard they must be at senior levels and they must be sitting at the table and as we can see with black lives matter you know we've had the anti-CA riots in India, what you will see post-COVID is more of this, right? more of this rising up and saying um, that we don't accept this. And that, that again is, uh, I guess I'm wondering if that translates into decisions that consumers will make as to where to buy. I mean, and you said it before, it probably doesn't matter as much sustainability from a, a lens for the consumers that you're talking to. I'm assuming that applies as well to this. This is more, a, it's the right thing to do yeah, I, I think you could potentially have consumer backlash, correct? You could have, you know, we saw with that, um, the Coke incident, incident with right. Cristiano, correct? Although it probably got them more free <laughs> publicity and probably worked for their brand. Um, you know, it's not that the consumer might make that choice, but, you know, there could be, uh, we've seen things happen with Cadbury and, sort of Nestle and stuff. So things can backlash um, backlash in other ways also. I just want to say one more thing because, you know, we're talking to an audience of a lot of entrepreneurs and CEOs, correct? And, you know, I always used to joke that at HBS, I was sure that the percentage of mental health issues was higher than in the general population, correct? So this entrepreneurship type A people... Um, also come with the downside which you know and it is their tenacity you know and they don't like to listen and they don't like to hear no but one muscle that a leader must build very strongly for diversity and inclusion is their own authenticity their own self-awareness and their own ability to listen correct because it starts from the top so that's just something very critical to think about mm. um, that you know you've not put so that there's not fear in people to actually tell you hey you know buddy this is off value and we should rethink what we're and doing. have you have you found good ways to ensure that that, that either you're doing that or that your people around you are, are are aware of when they are or aren't doing it yeah i think there's a i think look there's obviously tools like you know you do 360 degrees you seek feedback you um Values is not something that's etched in stone and then everyone just magically follows it. Okay? If it's etched in stone and put up on a poster, it's probably not being followed anyway. I think values is actually a muscle that you have to work out every day. And, you know, it's the stories being told of what you did in a particular situation. So, you know, you have to create the openness, the language around it, the ability to debate whether... Uh, you know, this is on value or off value, or this is inclusive or not inclusive, right? And it's not, I mean, you know, Parmesh, actually, you introduced mm -hmm. us, um, you know, and, you know, I think I'm very, um, I, I'd like to think I'm sort of 
open-minded and inclusive. But I've not lived a life where I've come across caste, mm-hmm. correct? I have a lot of LGBTQ friends. But, you know, when Parmesh told me, uh, he had to point out that we had spouse and not partner in our policy, yeah. correct? Probably something that even if I'd read it, wouldn't wouldn't naturally cross my mind. And I remember when he came to me and said, you know, uh, let's put let's have a gender transitioning policy you know i have to make him explain to me fully what it meant mm-hmm. right but if he was not at the table it's not going to happen and if i can't be open enough to listen it's not going to happen so do you know what i mean you need uh you need uh both the the what michael polen calls the set and the mm-hmm. setting you need the mindset and you need the right environment Oh, that was very uh, that was very helpful. And I think uh, look, I, I think to your point that the people that walk in the door have to be so strong minded and, and told. And that's actually you mentioned tenacity. It, one of the things that I had said to the people that we look very heavily for when we're talking to entrepreneurs is tenacity to survive through things. And to survive, you yeah. often have to be stubborn to the noise around you, which is telling you that or not noise, the voices around you that are telling you that it's not going to work. Yet, I guess, be open enough to listening to the, the things that are going to allow you to succeed. And I think, it, it, I guess, it's that balance that needs to continually be recorded. Yeah, and it's and different and different muscles and different things in different in different situations or different timing. Yeah. yeah. So, public markets, CEO of a public market, uh, a public company, and and yeah, and I guess the, the look the reason is the companies that have grown up in a venture-backed ecosystem. You guys, but when you stepped in, the business was public. You had kind of been there. The business had been there. It had developed certain processes. It had understood how to manage the, the different types of investors in a different way. And so you, you had to figure out how to deal with that and manage it. And I guess, is, what, what, do you, what do you think is really different or what do you think is important or what have you learned over the years in terms of being that public uh, company? leader so you know i think a few things one is um you know you have to know when to really ignore the market also correct because this quarterly and i guess these you know vc funded or private equity funded companies are also on the march to show numbers I guess, on a monthly basis. But you need to really decide, you know, there is this quarterly, uh, you know, there is a quarterly pressure. There is no long term without a short term. But you need to really sort of deftly um, manage manage between the two. And if you're the CEO, you really need your eyes on the long term, right? What's happening next? Making sure you're, um, you know, investing for the future, not, you know, in FMCG, it's an extremely bad habit where sort of, you know, people dump sales at the end of the month, correct, to show numbers. You know, remembering that cash is always reality is sort of uh, critical. So if I if I had to, you know, leave with advice, I would say a couple of things. With your institutional investors, your big investors, always be truthful, correct? Mm-hmm. Don't, uh, don't. Don't actually overpromise or don't underpromise. Just be honest. So I'll give you an example. I actually took over as CEO, um, CEO um, last year during COVID. Um, the company hadn't been doing uh, too well. You know, growth was uh, growth was sort of low, single digits. And actually, the COVID year because of March, we actually had a two or three uh, percent degrowth. And I went in to you know investors and said here is the bad news and the bad news is not just covid it's xyz correct and here is what i'm gonna do about it and i cannot tell you how everyone and you know this is why i'm taking over ceo how uh like i had investors actually tell me we are you know we've not been excited about the company for the last a uh, few years, we were not sure about what you were saying to us, and thank you for your honesty. And I'm going to mm. buy, correct? So I think you have to be honest, correct? Um, and you know, 
I, I know sometimes it doesn't feel like that when you're chasing money, but in the long run, I think that's really what counts. And your what you tell investors externally is what you must be saying internally in the company. Don't make those two stories different, correct? So it's authenticity, uh, it's truth. And then it's learning, uh, it's learning how to drive the short term with the long term, right? How to drive, um, you know, enough investment for long term growth, but managing the PNL in the short term without bagging the numbers and without sort of playing with the yeah, numbers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, and I'd imagine the metrics for success in a public world look a little bit different than what some of these companies have been used to in the private environment, which has been a lot of willingness to believe in the future and don't worry about it to later. Whereas I think as a public company, you get evaluated on, okay, I want to see some of this stuff now much more so. Yeah. But if you can tell, if you can tell someone, correct. If you say you don't have good performance, but if you have clarity of what the issue with that performance is and what you're going to do about it, then people, people will give you some space. Correct. But if you, you know, I've seen a lot of which people love to do is like externalize it, correct? Say it's all the macro um, and, you know, but you should be honest with your, obviously you don't want to give out information that's, you know, competitive or whatever, but you need to be honest and you, that's the CEO's job, correct? Like um, you have to balance the long term. Where is this industry going? What are my brands of the future? you know, where do I find the money to fuel that, correct? Because you have to do that. But in the short term, go and sort out, go and sort out the issues, correct? Go figure out what's happening. Don't bag numbers to cover it up because it becomes a negative spiral. And don't externalize. So one one last question. Coming out of this, and I'm not, I know yeah. we're not out of it, as we were talking about earlier before we even got started here, but... I guess just having lived through a year and a half of this and imagining that as it continues on, we now understand a little bit better how to manage stuff. Um, yeah. What, are you back to a place of feeling excited about what, what can happen for business going forward? Are you tentative? Are you, are you focusing on something that you think is going to be big and new coming ahead? What, what interests you, what excites you in, in this world right now? I think from a business perspective, uh, uh, you know, I'm quite excited in terms of what this digitization and productivity um, can mean. And I think if the government takes sort of, you know, there is going to be a shifting of the global supply chain. I don't think, you know, it for us it will shift overnight. But if they put in good means, uh, you know, for increasing sort of manufacturing jobs and stuff, um, that can be huge for us as a country. So, um, I mean, you know, I'm hopeful of these things happening. I'm not 100% sure uh, so Sure, they it, will. It starts with that, I guess. Hope, hope, and, hope and optimism. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And I have a new CEO. Maybe I should plug him. Um, he's, if you guys want to know more about consumer goods... Uh, read his book called The CEO Factory, although it is about Hindustan <laughs> Union, but yeah. <laughs> so I don't know whether I should be plugging that or not, but no, they are a great company. And um, so I'm quite excited. Uh, he, you know, he's really like, um, you know, I think one of his sort of outstanding strengths is knowing the Indian consumer and um, how these sort of penetration and demand cycles work and stuff. So I'm, quite excited excellent Lisa thank you so much for doing this um, as always, always most uh, welcome and so interesting to hear sort of the, the the lens of what you see going on because as you point out we we per perhaps tend to look at a different part of India uh, from the, the businesses we get into and I think the desire is to find products yeah. that appeal to the markets that you have but I think it's a hard journey to figure out how to create that and um, it's, I'm, I'm always impressed with how you do it Thank you.